Hi there and welcome to the Framework in Focus, a videocast series where we provide insight into our ebook, which is titled Musculoskeletal Clinical Translation Framework from Knowing to Doing. It's good how you can do that without even reading it. A uh, bit of a mouthful, so we shall hereunto refer to it as the framework. Uh, we hope this series will complement the ebook, providing additional insight into the whys, whens, wheres and hows of the framework. And this goal aligns with our ongoing efforts to facilitate knowledge translation in the management of musculoskeletal pain. We are at number 10, whole person considerations. This is our warning slide where we tell you we are talking about a single element today, but actually uh, that's a bit false because all elements are important and they're all interrelated. And that's particularly pertinent why we've got this one called whole person. Yes. Because <laughs> it is that step back. There's good quotes around this, I think, Darren, isn't there? I think you might have found one, Tim. I do. Why don't you read that one? The trick to forgetting the big picture is to look at everything close up. Yes. <laughs> that's from... Chuck. The, the, from Chuck, the man behind the fight club. Yes, and, and how many rules about the framework are there, Tim? Um, there's only one, which is about look at the big picture. Oh, yeah. I was going to say there's only one, share it with a friend. Ah, very good. <laughs> right. But if you watch the movie Fight Club, you do get caught in the detail and you may miss the big picture, big picture and broader messages, and that's really what this element of the framework's about. Indeed. Uh, so we have a picture here of a DMA strand turning into a person. I, I, I'm, I stole this off the internet, as you do with um, pictures. So apologies to the person I stole it from. But um, yeah, I think there's there's a, a, an understanding that there's a genetic component to pain disorders um, generally. Yep. Lots of research has been done on that. Um, but the geneticists have come to the uh, conclusion that the genes aren't the answer to everything. Um, and the behavioural scientists, you know, perhaps like us, so we've come to the uh, understanding that environmental factors are not all of it. <laughs> um, so there is a, a bridging of the gap between that and epigenetics is maybe part of that bridge where gene expression is important and um, understanding um, that, that actually can ch probably change over time yeah. um, and um, probably does lead into, um, we didn't talk about it before, but those early life stress events and adversity um, you know, in your life, particularly early in life, but at any time, and the effect that that can have on, on your system at that time. And, and I, I often discuss this as like it almost primes your system, yeah. so then years later something can happen and it goes into overdrive. Yeah, one of my caveats around that is, you know, that's a, getting into a deeper, more complex topic, but there is good science behind muscular, persistent musculoskeletal pain disorders and early life stress events, as yeah. you've mentioned, so we do need to be aware of that, mm. but how we deal with that, I mean, we may not need to go into that at all, so in the clinical setting, yeah. that could be a bit more individual. I think if people <coughs> say, you might say, like, you know, how, if you've had these stress events in the past, how did you deal with that, and are there similarities to how you're dealing with the situation in front of you now? Yeah, and, I agree that's particularly helpful at times yeah but you're not going to say to every patient oh have you had any significant life stress events no no it's 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 not something you do day one i would say but some people will come out and give you their whole life story and yeah. i mean we're, we're talking about you know significant things around sexual abuse and those kind of um things here other things around you know there's other stri there's life stress events that uh, might be more pertinent to the recent future around weddings, change of job, loss of job, yeah. different things like that. <laughs> because it's linked with persistent pain disorders, I find rather than questioning anything on that specifically, and I think we possibly talked about this earlier, of knowing about someone's symptoms and broadly their bigger picture, knowing do they have other pain disorders? Yeah. And that's where that can be really important if they said, yeah, look, I've had long-term migraines or irritable bowel syndrome or I'm diagnosed with um, fibromyalgia yep. or restless leg syndrome. They're examples of other pain comorbidities that are known to have an increased risk of persistent pain when yep. someone, say, has developed a more focal pain such as back pain or shoulder yep. pain, for example. And I think that's incredibly important, like, uh, many times I might see somebody that comes in, let's say, with shoulder pain, 
and um, they're having troubles getting that better. Seemingly they've had management that's reasonable focused on that. Yeah. But actually when you sit back and speak to them, yeah, they do have all these other things going on and then potentially a very different mechanism of pain going on here that's actually more global and needs a different approach. Yeah, <laughs> and we have talked about this earlier, that list of three things of when someone's symptoms have started. So let's stick with shoulder pain. Someone comes in, came in and says, I've felt fallen over and I've really wrenched my shoulder and I've felt something give or go what give way in my shoulder when I fell over. That's a specific incident. Yeah. Um, someone may also say I've been painting the house and I've been doing lots of stuff overhead and with repetition of that my shoulders got sore versus the insidious onset. Now my shoulders just sore. Yeah. So if you take someone with other comorbid health conditions, that's helpful. There's specific trauma there in the first instance. So the local pathology may be relevant irrespective of the underlying pain disorders. Yeah. That said, if they're not responding to management directed of the pathology, we need to be aware of those mm. coexisting pain conditions yeah. because that can certainly influence different pain mechanisms as we've talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, and also the prognosis around that, so perhaps time frames, for yeah. example. It might be different. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good. So, um, I think um, maybe we'll go move on to kind of the non-pain comorbidities. Um, yeah. So, diabetes uh, comes to mind for me straight away. Yeah. Um, so, things around the capacity of the body to heal and recover. Yeah. So, if there is specific tissue injury, that's a, a classic example. I mean, obviously, something like tendon health, if someone's diabetic, their healing rate from injury or sort of recovery with tendinopathy type conditions, we know that'll be delayed. Obviously, nerve related issues in yeah. conditions uh, such as diabetes, because you can obviously have diabetic neuropathy as part of that, but broadly, if someone has some of these health conditions, and the other one's metabolic syndrome, so yeah. broadly in terms of lower levels of general health, again, healing rates and expected time frames for recovery may change around that. Mm. Yeah, I have, I've had a patient um, over the last nine months, I guess, and that I've reviewed multiple times, and uh, he was diabetic, but well controlled, completely controlled by exercise, high yeah. level of exercise. Uh, hurt his back at work, ended up with radiculopathy and surgery for that. Um, but it hasn't been a great result in terms of pain. And um, he has completely had to stop the exercise he was doing and now his diabetes is out of control. So right. the effect of the pain disorder then on the, um, you know, the health disorder is, is um, quite pertinent in that guy's case. <laughs> Yeah, so again, we've talked previously about the bi-directional relationships of things, yeah. so that mm -hmm. can certainly exist here. And you've just really got to keep this in mind around, you ask people around their general health and other pain conditions or, or general health conditions, and obviously there's medications associated with that as well, where yeah. people will be on certain medications that might potentially interact or have an impact on healing or sleep or being mindful of what you should expect around changes in exercise levels as well. Yeah. So it's really that understanding of the, the bigger picture of the person and whatever individual condition they have. Yeah, and there's many times I can think of where I've seen patients that feel they have a local problem or multiple local problems that yeah. haven't put it together and it actually is a kind of light bulb moment for them to say, yeah. oh yeah, actually there, there is this broader thing that's going on. Yeah, so it can go both ways where people have let's say osteoarthritis and then, or rheumatoid arthritis, and their pain problem gets lumped in with that, but yes. it's something separate. Yeah. Or the other way around, as you say, there's a real focus of people that say, I've got this pain and this pain and this pain and this pain. And as a rough summary, the more pains people describe to me, the less likely I am to focus on the individual pains. Yeah. A, it takes too long. <laughs> but B, if you're chasing all of those all the time, you're probably wasting your time and you need to step back and go bigger picture, yeah. what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, good, um, so whole person considerations, general health, comorbidities, 
Um, I mean, it links with a number of the lifestyle things that we've spoken yeah, about in does. terms of obesity, um, diet, yeah. smoking alcohol in a way. Yeah. Um, other, other things you wanted to just, talk about on this? Yeah, just practical tip. In the clinic, we have screening questionnaires, which we've previously talked about. But if you have questionnaires that ask people and ours do about other health conditions, yeah. so that's a red flag disorder screen, but it also brings this up, other pain conditions, and then also medications. So you can get patients to fill that out early on and you can do a quick scan of that so it doesn't necessarily take heaps of time. Yeah. And then we've got the sliding scale again yeah. around how this is contributing. And honestly, there's no rule of, well, if you've got this, it means it's a big factor. The scale can change, but if you've flagged it as a potential relevant, it just really says, hang on, let's do our specific management if that's relevant early. If it's not working, mm. let's reflect back on this. Yeah. And if you do that collaboratively with the person, you might say, look, you've got these other things going on. Yeah. I've got that in my mind. You've got this specific knee or shoulder issue. We're going to start managing that yeah. as a shoulder or a knee issue. But if we're not getting there, we're going to mm. reconsider these things. Yeah. And I, I, I think this is one area that really probably transforms part of my care of people with musculoskeletal pain, like being a, an experienced musculoskeletal clinician but still treating this stuff as a tick box um, activity to then understanding how that integrates into practice. Uh, I'm sure that's made a big difference to the way I've dealt with a lot of people. And it certainly helped me then go with some of these patients, my Brilliant treatment's not helping them at all. Yes. <laughs> so do I need to do more different brilliant treatments or do I need to step back and look more broadly? And that's made me much more comfortable around not being able to fix everyone. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just have a broader perspective on it. Good. Good, good, good. Hey, we're back. <laughs> so I wonder if Tim will bother cutting that out or not. I'll let it be out. Oh, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, okay, this is the framework and that's the magnificent one-page summary of the framework there that you can get from musculoskeletalframework.net in English, in Japanese, in simple Chinese, in... Oh, there's lots of... there's French. French. I think there's German, there's Italian, there's Spanish. There may be more, but you're in the middle of doing some of those translations. So if they're not there yet, let us know, or they might be coming soon. Yes, I, I'm getting there. I'm yeah. getting there. Good. All, All right. right. Last comments. You can see the purple one is that whole person consideration. So it's, it's part of the bigger picture. And we talk about this often. If that's not an area you're comfortable with, that's okay. You can flag it with the person if they agree some of those things are issues then you can always on refer within your profession or to other healthcare practitioners. So Absolutely. working as a team around this is one of our big recommendations. Great, thanks Tim. Thank you Darren. My pleasure. <laughs>